If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to start in John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verses 44 and following. If you have your Bibles, turn there to John chapter 8. And if you're able, please stand as we read God's Word together. We're going to look at the words of Jesus here in this passage. John chapter 8, starting in verse 44. Jesus, addressing the crowd to whom he is speaking, makes the following statement. You are the father, you are of your father, excuse me, the devil. And you do the desires of your father. For he was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. You know, Jesus and Satan are polar opposites of one another. Scripture tells us that Jesus is a liar. As a matter of fact, it is very nature. To lie. I'm sorry, Jesus. I didn't say Jesus is a liar. I, maybe I did, but I didn't mean to. I'm old senile. Satan is a liar. He is the father of lies. His very nature is to lie. As a matter of fact, in our own modern language today, we would say it's in his DNA. He's a liar. That's just who he is. Jesus, on the other hand, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we know that Jesus is honest, that he is transparent, that he is trustworthy. This morning in our passage in Genesis, we're going to look at a lie. And we're going to talk about the topic of lying. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for those of us who were able to come and gather this morning here in this place. Lord, thank you for those of us who are joining us at home and elsewhere online. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us as only you can this morning through the proclamation of your word, that we might hear it, that we might heed it, and that we might be changed by it. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're being seated, you can turn back to our main text. Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. Where we will continue our series called... The Chosen Church. The Chosen Church. We are looking at the age of the patriarchs. That time period in which God chose, of all the people on the earth, Abraham. And then chose from among Abraham's descendants, one specifically. And then chose from Isaac's descendants, one specifically. Through whom to propagate the people that would become Israel, his chosen people. This age of the origin of Israel, covered in the book of Genesis from chapter 12 to chapter 50, we call it the age of the patriarchs. This week we have been, or I'm sorry for the past few weeks, man, I'm not speaking very good today. Oh, and you need to be listening carefully and catch me, okay? When I mess up. Over the last couple of months, we have been preaching on the life of Abraham. This is the ninth sermon today in our series. And this is the last message of the series that focuses exclusively on Abraham. Starting next week, we will introduce Isaac, Abraham's son. And gradually, we will transition from Abraham's life to Isaac's life. But this message is a scene in the life of Abraham that is quite reminiscent of a previous scene that took place in the life of Abraham. As we discuss the message today, you might get a, a sense of deja vu that you've heard this story before. Because you have heard something very similar to this before. Let me give you a personal example. About two and a half years ago, in November, 
Janice and I got in our car. It was the second week of the playoffs, football. We drove to watch Leah march in the band and to watch our high school boys play football at Bobcat Stadium in Childress, where they played against the West Texas Aztecs from Stratford and that area up in that air, uh, part of Texas. And we got beat. That day we sit on the north side of the stadium and watch that game. A year later, Janice and I got in the car, drove to Childress, Texas, sat on the north side of the Bobcat Stadium, watched Liam march in the band, watched our boys play against the West Texas Aztecs, and watched our boys get beat and drove home. There are some differences in what happened one year and the next year. For example, one year we didn't have Paul, and the next year we did have Paul. But the basic elements of the story were the same. There are scriptural evidences of that as well. For example, in John chapter 2, we read that at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus cleansed the temple. And then we read in the Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that at the end of Jesus' ministry, he cleansed the temple again. Yep. A couple of years ago here at Calvary Baptist Church, we did a series through the Exodus. In the book of Exodus, when the children of Moses, or when the, when the children of God being led by Moses arrive at Mount Sinai, right prior to arriving there, they, of all things, grumble. I know they never did that, but on this occasion they did. And if you remember, God provided water from a rock. But if you remember that series very carefully, you also know that sometime later, after they refused to go in the promised land and started wandering around in the desert for 40 years, they still were grumbling. And guess what God did a second time? Provided water from a rock. You see, we all have experience in our life where there are situations we seem to go through that are very similar to a situation we did before. Sometimes... That's a good thing because it gives us an opportunity to correct something that we did wrong the first time. Other times, it's just part of life. We tend to have things repeated over and over again. And this morning as we study this passage, we're going to see a similar scene in Abraham's life that we saw earlier. So let's dig into it and find out exactly what I'm talking about. First point this morning... I'm calling Abimelech's unwitting sin. Abimelech's unwitting sin. Genesis chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Now Abraham journeyed from there toward the land of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur, and then he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, She is my sister, said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream at night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. Now Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will you slay the nation, even though blameless? Did he not say to me, She is my sister? And she herself said, He is my brother. In integrity of heart and in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. And then God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this, and I have also kept you from sinning against me, therefore I did not let you touch her. Now therefore restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you will surely die, you and all who are yours. In the days following the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which we read last week in chapter 19, for some reason that the Bible does not say, but for some reason Abraham and Sarah decided to move, to relocate. 
I suspect this was probably very shortly after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because I don't think they would have moved necessarily if she was pregnant. And we know that she is going to have Isaac a year from now. So in the days or weeks after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, for whatever reason, they picked up and the scripture says they headed south towards the Negev. Now the Negev is a desert. Northern Saudi Arabia, modern day. The area of Arabia, it's, it's desert. And so they were journeying south towards the Negev. And for whatever reason, again, it's unclear in Scripture. They turned eastward and came to the Philistine city of Gerar. It's in the land of Philistia. Not in Canaan, per se, but in the land of Philistia. And they settled in Gerar. Now the king of the city was a Philistine king named Abimelech. And as they had done several years earlier, specifically back in chapter 12 when they journeyed to Egypt, Abraham and Sarah again repeated their lie about the true nature of their relationship. Rather than telling the Philistine monarch Abimelech that they were married they instead said that they were merely brother and sister because in that day the custom of kings were to take women that they wanted for themselves because they were the king and could and place them in their harem or their concubine or among their maids, place them in their household to use as they wished. And so, just as they had lied to Pharaoh for fear that Pharaoh might kill Abraham and take Sarah, now they, they lied to the Philistine king Abimelech for the same reason. And sure enough, when they arrive and they say, we are merely brother and sister, Abimelech, has no disdain for Abraham because in his mind they're not married and he takes Sarah for himself and leaves Abraham be. But if you notice in Scripture, it tells us that before the king made any physical advances towards Sarah, the Lord appeared to him in a dream. A dream at night. Now granted, let's, let's pause here for a minute. At this point, Sarah is 90 years old. 90. And so she wasn't as young as she was back in chapter 12. It's not to say she still wasn't a beautiful woman, but the king had not taken hasty steps to be with her physically yet. And the Lord appeared to him and intervened and said to Abimelech, Hey, you messed up, buddy. You have taken a married woman. And in so doing, you have sinned against the Lord. You have sinned. You have made a mistake. But of course, the king was surprised to hear that he had taken a married woman. He was shocked to learn that Abraham and Sarah were in fact wed to one another because both of them had withheld that information from him. They had deceived him. And so in his conversation with the Lord, Abimelech pleaded with God and asserted that he had been fooled. And had he known the truth, had he known that Sarah was married, that he would not have taken her, that he would have left her alone. I want you to notice that as Abimelech tries to maintain his innocence and plead that what he did, he did without knowledge. He did unwittingly. Verse 6, it says, and God says, yes, I know. 
I know that in the integrity of, the, of your heart you have done this. In other words, God doesn't dispute the fact that he didn't know. I know you didn't know. But that's not the issue. The issue is you've still sinned. Maybe you didn't know it, but you sinned. And if you don't take steps to resolve this issue, there's going to be punishment. Look at the last verses of verse, or last words of verse 7. If you don't restore her, you will surely die. <laughs> and all of those who are yours, listen. This is an incident that highlights for us an important truth, and that is this. Ignorance of sin is not an acceptable excuse for sin. Amen. Let me say that again. Ignorance of sin is not an acceptable excuse before God for sin. In the modern American justice system, we say it this way. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. If you're driving through a school zone at 50 miles an hour and the cop pulls you over and you say, I didn't see the sign, I didn't know. The cop's going to say, sorry buddy, here's your ticket. <laughs> Ignorance of the law is no excuse. That's not an American ideal. That is a biblical principle. As a matter of fact, let me read to you from Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Paul, writing to the Romans, says the following in this verse. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is God's, his eternal power and divine nature, these things have been clearly seen, being understood through what was made, so that they are without, listen to me, they are without excuse. The Bible is very clear. No person will stand before God and say to God, I didn't know that you existed. I don't, I don't deserve to go to hell, God, because I never heard about you. There's no excuse. God creates us in His image with enough knowledge of Him that we know. Listen, some people deny it. Some people suppress it. Some people have done so for so long that perhaps it's so far buried that they don't even think about it anymore. But the knowledge of God is inherent within us. And if we will pursue it, Scripture says, I am not near for many of you. If you will pursue me, you will find me. Same can be said for our moral condition. We are born with a conscience. Granted, some of us may not nurture it as we should. Some of us may not mature as we should. Some of us may not increase our knowledge of God's Word. But nevertheless, we know what is right and wrong at the core level. And we are responsible for it. Abimelech took a married woman. I didn't know she was married. Nevertheless, you took some uh, a woman. You took her. You're responsible. God, I didn't know. It doesn't matter. Ignorance of sin is not an acceptable excuse for sin. Secondly... Another lesson we could draw from this portion of the text. One sin does not justify another sin. Yes, Abraham and Sarah lied. That's not a question. And yes, their deception created the environment which led to Abimelech's lie. See, Abimelech's argument was this. If they hadn't sinned to begin with, 
then I wouldn't have sinned either. So what he's saying in essence is, it's their fault. They caused me, they put me in this situation, and in essence caused me to sin unknowingly. Listen, what I love about this is God doesn't, God doesn't dispute that. God says, I know, <laughs> I know. I know you, you were acting in your integrity. I know that, that you didn't know the whole story. I get that. But guess what? One sin still does not excuse another. Their sin did not absolve him from his sin. Abimelech's unwitting sin. The second point this morning. Abraham's unfounded sin. Justification. Abraham's unfounded justification. We continue in verse 8. So Abimelech arose early in the morning. Remember God spoke to him at night. So he arose early in the morning. And called all of his servants. And told these things in their hearing. And all the men were greatly frightened. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him. What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? What have, what have done to me? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What have you encountered that you have done this thing? And Abraham said, because I thought surely there is no fear of God in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is actually my sister. The daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came about when God caused me to wonder from my father's house that I said to her, This is the kindness that you will show me. Everywhere we go, say of me. He is my brother. Well, having learned the truth from God during the night, early the next morning, Abimelech got up and called all of his servants together and shared the news about what he had done. And all of them were Upset and disturbed and a little bit frightened, Scripture says. Not knowing what might happen next. And so, Abimelech, following the instructions that God had given him, called Abraham into his presence because the Lord had told him, back in verse 7, to... Have Abraham pray for him so that he might be restored and that his punishment might be taken away or removed. So Abimelech called Abraham in for this reason. But before he did that, understandably, he was a little upset. And he said, Abraham... What have I done? What did, what did I do to you? What did we do to you? That would cause you to lie to us, deceive us, and in so doing bring about the hand of God upon us. What, what, how did we wrong you? What, what is it that we did that, that made you mad at us or, or, or caused you to act this way. I, I don't get it. And notice one of the things Abraham said is, well, we, we suspected that there were no God-fearing people in this place. Can I throw in just a quick lesson here? Be careful what you presume about others. You might be wrong.
the king had Abraham pray for him. But before he did so, Abraham tried to explain himself. He tried to rationalize his deceit. Two primary excuses he gave. The first one was this. Listen, king. I'm sorry. I, I, was, I was merely trying to protect myself and my wife from harm. You see, if, if, if you as king decided to take Sarah for yourself and you knew that we were married, you might have me killed so that you could take Sarah and that would leave me dead and it would leave her a grieving widow. And neither of those scenarios is good. So we lied to protect ourselves from possible harm. That was excuse number one. Excuse number two. And really, to be honest with you, King, we didn't completely lie. Because the truth of the matter is, she is actually my sister. My half-sister. We share one parent, but not the other. And so, technically... I didn't lie, and she didn't lie. Have your kids ever tried this on you before? Mom, Dad, technically, technically, I didn't lie. What I said was the truth. Yeah, what you didn't say was what was important. You see... The reality is, yes, they were half brother and sister, but they were also, also husband and wife. And the fact that they were husband and wife was what was important for this particular situation. It was what was germane to the circumstances. If you want to see this in action, go turn on the news. They will tell you the truths that are convenient to their slant. And they will leave out the truths that are contrary to their slant. Oh, well, we told you the truth. Did you? Did you really? A half-truth is not a truth. It's a lie. What's interesting about this is that this scene describes something that happened in the life of Abraham and Sarah, not just here, but also before. They had hidden their marriage back in Egypt, as I've mentioned a couple of times already in this sermon, and now they're doing it again here in Philistia. And guess what, beloved? It was a sin then, and it's a sin now. It was wrong both times. But what I find interesting here is that their willingness to repeat this same deceitful strategy, I think is an example for us of how easy it is for us to repeat our sinful behavior and try to justify it again and again and again. You know, there are some people who have pet sins. They have favorite sins that somehow in their mind they justify it and they just do it over and over and over and over again. It gets to the point that it, it doesn't even bother them. And it's interesting because one person's pet sin may not affect another person at all. Some people are perpetual drunks. We talked about drunkenness, drunkenness last week. Alcohol has such an allure to them. They, they just are drawn to it. And then there's people like me who, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't affect me at all. 
I mean, it would affect me if I drank it, but I mean, the allure of it doesn't affect me at all. I don't drink, never drunk. Doesn't make me greater than anybody else. It just means that my area of weakness is something different. Apparently, Abraham and Sarah had an area of weakness when it came to telling the truth regarding their marriage. It seems that certain sins are more attractive to some people than others. And apparently, Abraham and Sarah had no qualms with lying in an effort to save their skins. Although neither time did it turn out well. The last point this morning is God's unmerited forgiveness. Of Amalek's unwitting sin, Abraham's unfounded justification, and God's unmerited forgiveness. Let's finish the chapter. Starting in verse 14. Abimelech, excuse me, Abimelech took the sheep, took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave to them and, they, and restored to Abraham his wife Sarah. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you, so settle wherever you please. And to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, it is your vindication before all who are with you, and before all men you are cleared. And Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maids, so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed fast the wombs of Abimelech and his household because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. You know, I'm not really sure that Abraham or that Abimelech ever got a good excuse for why Abraham lied to him. Fact is, there was no good excuse. So finally, Abimelech just consented to do what God had told him in the dream to do. Have Abraham pray for you so that you might be forgiven, so that you might be restored. And that's what he had Abraham do. In addition to that, you notice that Abimelech gave Abraham several animals, sheep and oxen, and some human servants, male and female. One of the distinctions between this story and the story previously, back in Egypt, when Pharaoh found out, if you remember, he had them escorted out of the country. He kicked them out and said, you guys have brought some hardship on me. Get out of here. And he sent some people with him to make sure they left. Here in chapter 20 in Philistia, King Abimelech says, look, the land is before you. You could settle anywhere in Philistia. You could settle anywhere in this, in this region. I'll give it to you. Just don't lie to me again, please. In addition to that, in order to vindicate Sarah, Abimelech paid Abraham a thousand pieces of silver. This was kind of a dowry, if you will, to restore her. And her purity, I guess you would say. One of the things that is just kind of a side note, but I, I think it's funny and kind of worth pointing out in verse 16. Abimelech looks to Sarah and says, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Let's stop right there. Think about that for just a minute. The king has just found out that in fact they're not brother and sister. In fact, her husband and wife. And so when you read this text, probably the best way to express it is like this. Sarah, I have given to your brother a thousand pieces of silver. There's a little sarcasm in his voice there. I think that's kind of interesting that the Bible doesn't shy away from that. Nevertheless, that's not the main issue, but it's worth pointing out. Abimelech had Abraham pray for he and his household. Because as we read there, the Lord had closed the womb of Abimelech's wife and his maids. In other words, his household line was going to end if he did not repent. 
punishment was in place. And he needed to pray. He needed to have Abraham pray on his behalf so that he might be forgiven and restored. And when he did, God healed the king and his family so that they were both able, or so that they were able to bear children once again. I want to say before I leave this section of the text that when you look at these two men, Abraham and Abimelech, in this passage, both of them sinned against God. We've already talked about that some. And yet, Abraham was the minister, if you will. He was called of God and held a religious position of authority because of God's calling. Not because he was morally superior. Because he wasn't. In fact, you could argue that Abraham knowingly sinned, which is worse than unknowingly sinning. Can you imagine the humility of King Abimelech to say, I've got to go to the guy who sinned against me and have him pray for me? Yes. Why? He's just as morally destitute as I am. Listen, the calling of God is not necessarily based <laughs> upon the moral condition of the person. As a pastor, I have to say that's good news to me. Just because... I have the calling of God on my life to stand up here and preach to you this morning. Do not misunderstand. I am a sinner just like you. I am not blameless. I am not perfect, nor is any pastor, priest, or any man of God in any capacity. We are human beings. And just because you may come to us for prayer... Don't mistake that for meaning that we are perfect because we are not even close. Every prophet in the Bible, every single one made mistakes. Every single one committed sins. Every pastor, myself included, has faltered at times and sinned before God. I have failed as a pastor. I have failed as a husband. I have failed as a father. I have failed as a son, a brother a whatever, a school teacher or principal, and everything that I've done, there has been imperfection and weakness and brokenness. And the same can be said for any pastor or any preacher anywhere. Listen, Abraham wasn't praying for Abimelech because Abraham was morally superior. Abraham had been placed in a position of ministerial authority. God did it. And as such, he was the man of God. And he prayed. But listen to me. Don't expect your pastor or your religious leaders to be perfect because they aren't. And if you do so, you will be gravely disappointed when they fail. And we've seen example of this time and time again. I should not be. I should not be the role model that you're looking to. We're looking to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We're not looking to our pastor or our Sunday school teacher or anyone else. Your pastor is a person just like you. Your pastor faces the same temptations as you. Your pastor goes through the same trials as you. Your pastor fails at times just like you do. Do not hold your pastor to a higher standard than you would hold yourself. Abraham. Abraham was guilty of lying, and yet he was the person praying for Abimelech. 
As we come to the conclusion of this message this morning, there's a question that comes to my mind. It's a great question. It's a good thought-provoking conundrum that sometimes we find ourselves in. The question is this. Is it always wrong to lie under any circumstance? You see, this story is now the second time in Abraham and Sarah's life when they hide the truth about their marriage. And beloved, in neither of the two passages in chapter 12 or here in chapter 20, do they ever apologize or repent for lying. Neither time. And to add even more to it, in both cases, they are given gifts of animals and servants and even money. Strangely, they're given these gifts by the, by the very person they lied to. And in either case, apparently, unless there's more to the story not in the text, which there could be, but apparently, based on what we have in black and white, neither one of them ever feels guilty enough about their deception to repent. It's not recorded in Scripture that they do. And so that begs the question. Were they justified to lie? They didn't feel bad about it because they did the right thing. Which brings us back to the bigger question. Is it ever okay to lie or is lying always under any circumstance a sin? Well, let me try to answer the question in this way as we wrap up this morning. Nowhere in Scripture ever does the Bible condone, condone the sin of lying. You will not find it. Even in this story, Scripture does not condone Abraham and Sarah's behavior. It did not condone it when they were Abram and Sarai and they lied to Pharaoh back in chapter 12. It never says that they were right to do so. God didn't tell them in either case to do so. Scripture never ever gives any instance or verse or any implication at all that justifies lying. It's not there. And even though lies, like in these stories, might lead to material outcomes that are beneficial, they might lead to what would seem like positive outcomes. Look at all the stuff they got from lying. It's important to realize that in neither of these passages, nor anywhere else in Scripture, are these uh, items that they received expressly attributed to the blessing of God. You see, we can't say based on the text that God blessed them materially for lying. Scripture doesn't say that. You know, some people who lie and cheat and commit all sorts of crimes find positive success, which encourages them to lie even more. If you're willing to stab somebody in the back, you may climb the corporate ladder quicker. If you're willing to compromise yourself in some way, you might be able to get a position that's higher. In this case, they lied. They received all sorts of stuff for it. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the blessing of God. Sometimes the things that come into our life that we may think are good are actually curses and we don't realize it. There's a line in a song that I love. It's one of my favorite lines in all the songs. And the line says this. Help me not to mistake happiness for blessing. Yeah. Sometimes the things that make us happy are not the blessing of God. And in fact, the same things that make us happy down the road 
could destroy us. There's not any situation in the Bible where God's word justifies lying, but one might make the argument that in some situations it's the better of two or more bad options. For example, in Nazi Germany, if you're hiding Jews and the Gestapo comes and knocks on your door, said, we have a report that there are Jews hiding around here. Do you know anything about that? What do you do? You tell the truth? Yeah, they're in my basement. Yeah. Or do you lie? If your daughter's been making herself up for the prom and she's got everything on, but and this is hypothetical, Leah, so don't kill me, but then all of a sudden her makeup gets all messed up or something's wrong and she comes and says, how do you look? Yeah, I might want to point that out somehow or another, but I certainly don't want to say, you look like a mess. I need to tell her she looks beautiful and gorgeous, which she does, but I also need to find a way to... Do I lie and tell her, you look great? Or do I tell her the truth and have her mad at me? What do you do? Listen, I'm not going to stand here and argue today that there aren't situations in which lying is the better option. I'm not going to tell you there aren't. But these are rare, isolated situations. And even if it is the better of two bad options, it's still not ideal. And it may be the right choice given two bad choices, but just because it's the right choice doesn't mean it's right. As they say, the lesser of two evils is still evil. We live in a fallen world and sometimes as a result of sin in this world, we are left in situations where there is no good choice. So I'm not going to stand here today and say, nor does Scripture, by the way, say that lying is always wrong. But what Scripture doesn't ever do is condone lying. So I would say to you this. If you are in a situation where you feel that you have to tell a lie or where you lie unknowingly, as Abimelech did, I would just caution you. As soon as you find out or as soon as you have the opportunity, go ahead and repent of that anyway. We as Christians should aspire to be honest and trustworthy people. The Bible never justifies the sin of lying. There may be rare instances when it seems like the best option, but that still doesn't make it right. We as Christians should be honest and always tell the truth. I would ask you as a close this morning, have you lied? Are you harboring a lie right now? Maybe this invitation today would be a good time for you to come clean. The reality is God already knows. But He wants you to repent anyway. He wants to forgive you and restore you and bless you just like He did Abimelech when He came forward and repented.